Good morning. I'm Victoria Assis, co-chair of the Pathways to Prosperity Partnership. It's a real pleasure to be welcoming you today to the eighth annual national conference of the Pathways to Prosperity Partnership held virtually for the first time this year. We do hope we will be able to provide you with the same level of interest and engagement for which Pathways to Prosperity conferences have come to be known. We'd like to thank the sponsors for this conference, Immigrant Services Calgary, the YMCA of Greater Toronto's Immigrant Services, Windmill Microlending, the Royal Society of Canada, and Calgary Catholic Immigration Society. In addition, we are very grateful for the generous support provided by our main funder, Immigration, Refugees, and Citizenship Canada. At last year's conference, we talked about how immigration to Canada was at a crossroads, but little did we know what challenges lay ahead. With challenges come opportunities, however, and we hope to explore some of these opportunities in the next three days of this conference as we talk about the future of immigration and resettlement in Canada. We are all in different places, and I will now present the land acknowledgement where I am located at the University of Western Ontario in London, Ontario. I acknowledge that Western University is located on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabek, Haudenosaunee, Lenape Wakan, Adewandaran peoples on lands connected with the London Township and Sombra Treaties of 1796 and the Dish with One Spoon Covenant Wampum. This land continues to be home to diverse Indigenous peoples, First Nations, Métis and Inuit, whom we recognize as contemporary stewards of the land and vital contributors of our society. I'm Jean McCrae. I'm the other co-chair with Vicki of Pathways to Prosperity. Um, we now have a special guest, uh, the Honorable Marco Mendocino, Minister of Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship. Uh, the minister will speak for a few minutes uh, and then we'll answer your questions submitted, submitted through Slido. I think by this time most of us know how to use Slido, but um, you will submit your, your questions there and you can vote on questions. So if you see questions you'd like to have answered, vote them and then they'll go to the top of the list and we'll make sure that the minister has an opportunity to address those questions. Um, to participate, uh, you need to go to either on another uh, device or on your, on your screen to go to uh, www.slido.com um, and enter the event code, which is uh, P2P2020. And uh, there you can uh, enter your questions. So at this point, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Minister Mendocino. Minister. Um, merci, Jean. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the introduction and to uh, Vicky and to Patrick. And I will uh, begin by doing the same and acknowledging that I'm joining you today virtually uh, uh, from the traditional territories of the Algonquin. I want to say to Patrick that I was uh, very inspired by your words and in particular the themes that you evoked around contributing and giving back in service to others and something that is larger than who we are as individuals. And I believe that is very much a message that will resonate with, uh, with me and with, with everyone who is on this call. Um, there is something indeed very vocational about uh, giving back through immigration. And when I was listening to uh, what, what Vicky said uh, about last year's conference and how the theme there was that immigration was at a crossroads, we are certainly walking the road now in this, in this year of uh, 2020, a year in which we've seen a once in a century pandemic uh, upend life, uh, not only in government and immigration, but in every dimension and every aspect in our personal lives. And so uh, before I get into the, uh, the thrust of my, my remarks, I, I will uh, convey that I hope that you are all uh, doing well, that your families are staying healthy, and that uh, notwithstanding all of the challenges that we have had to confront over this past year, that I do see a point uh, in the horizon that is not too far off where, where things will be better. And that is in large part because of the work that we are doing together, um, what I think is a very resilient uh, Canadian spirit and indeed uh, our contributions to, to immigration, which 
which is very much anchored in the present, but it's also about our past and it's about our future. Um, and it's uh, hard to imagine uh, at times because this year has seemed like a, uh, an eternity, um, but it's just a little over a year that I was sworn in as the Minister for Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship Canada. I've often been asked uh, in looking back, is it everything that I imagined it would be? Well, it's safe to say that it, it has fulfilled all of my expectations and it has exceeded them in, in many regards. And that is because of the, the unique moment that we find ourselves in. And that's why I, I have been really um, putting, putting both feet uh, on the ground and trying to get out into the community and engaging with, with thought leaders uh, like the Pathway to Prosperity uh, so that we can have good conversations about the work that we are doing in immigration together. And, you know, just to, to evoke the theme before, before moving on to some of the nitty gritty, I, I will say that as we are walking the road, I do see a pathway to prosperity. And, and so it is, it is with great excitement and enthusiasm that, uh, that we're going to have a good conversation today. Nous avons tout de vivre cette expérience et d'apprendre à nous adapter à la nouvelle réalité. Certainement, à IRCC, nous continuons d'apprendre comment nous pouvons remplir notre mandat le mieux possible et nous le faisons de façon qui était inimaginable avant la pandémie. Of course, many, if not all of you, our settlement and resettlement partners have also been deeply affected by the pandemic. Throughout this exceptional year, you've gone to great lengths to ensure newcomers continue to have access to critical settlement and integration services. J'aimerais également profiter de l'occasion pour remercier tous ceux et celles qui font partie du partenaire Voix vers la prospérité pour leur travail continu afin d'aider le Canada et nos collectivités à accueillir les nouveaux arrivants. Be they economic immigrants, refugees, or their families, newcomers are making lasting contributions to our economy and our society. The pandemic has offered an opportunity to think about what really matters in our community, engaging in meaningful conversations about taking care of those of us who are around us and reflecting on the kind of future that we want to build. Settling newcomers and resettling refugees during the pandemic has not been easy. We have all had to innovate to find new and creative ways to offer the same level of services to those who need them. C'est grâce à ce solide partenariat que nous avons pu rapidement faire preuve de souplesse en permettant la prostatation de services à distance et en permettant aussi aux organismes d'aide à l'établissement d'acheter de, des ordinateurs ou des téléphones portables supplémentaires pour leurs clients afin que ceux-ci puissent recevoir des services en ligne. But resettlement continues despite the challenges and the work your organizations are doing is critical to our shared success. Canada has managed to welcome a few thousand refugees to their home this year, including through the government-assisted, privately sponsored, and blended visa office referred refugee programs. With the support of our international partners who have started to resume operations abroad, we will continue to identify and prioritize the most urgent cases. And we have recently begun facilitating resettlement movements from locations where conditions allow through ongoing coordination with the IOM, UNHCR, and other partners. An important part of this work is again communicating with our partners, ensuring appropriate capacity of resettlement assistant program service providers and sponsors in Canada. And again, in this area, we have seen innovation and collaboration. Resettlement agencies double down on their commitment to ensuring that resettled refugees were provided with the crucial supports they needed despite the challenges and complexities created by the pandemic. La pandémie a également amplifié des enjeux systémiques et des inégalités de longue date. Par exemple, nous avons que les immigrants en général et certaines minorités visibles sont plus susceptibles d'être au chômage ou d'avoir des faibles revenus. As we continue to gather more detailed information on the effects of COVID-19 on racialized Canadians, we know that the pandemic has also had a significant impact on the mental health of these groups. We also know that women who are new to Canada, especially visible minority and racialized women, face disproportionate challenges and multiple economic and social barriers. They are more likely than men to work in precarious part-time and lower paying jobs and are more likely to report childcare as the principal reason 
for working part time. That is why our government has been providing them with targeted support, including those facing additional barriers due to gender, sexual orientation, age, disability, and other factors. Among these supports are the Visible Minority Newcomer Women Pilot, which helps to advance employment and career opportunities for visible minority women and LGBTQ2 newcomers in Canada. Since the beginning of the pandemic, the government has worked to address social inequalities and to support our most vulnerable citizens. Avec nos nombreux partenaires, nous devons agir maintenant pour éliminer ensemble les inégalités de longue date et le racisme dans notre société. Pour ce faire, le rôle de nos partenaires locaux en matière d'immigration et des réseaux en immigration francophone continuera d'être crucial, surtout tandis que nous tentons d'encourager nos communautés les plus petites et éloignées à devenir plus accueillantes. As we look to attract more newcomers to our smaller communities, we must all actively work together to counter the false and negative narratives that sometimes surround immigration. I understand that local groups in Winnipeg are running a public campaign called COVID-19 does not discriminate and neither should you. In Hamilton, they've created videos to highlight the role of newcomers who are working on our front lines during the pandemic. Across our country, organizations are working to advance a, to a racially just recovery from COVID-19. So thank you sincerely for your contribution to making Canada a more welcoming and inclusive place for everyone to call home. From supporting the resettlement of Syrian refugees to your current efforts with respect to COVID-19, our local immigration partners and Réseau en Immigration Francophone have shown just how well we respond to emerging community needs and crises. Vous avez prouvé, maintes fois, que vous pouvez rapidement mobiliser des organismes locaux et que vous pouvez agir comme plaque tournant pour la coordination communautaire et l'échange de renseignements. Je vous remercie donc des partenaires si souples et proactifs. So, I've talked about what we've been doing over the past little while. Now, I'd like to look forward. From that famous expression, demography is destiny, we can derive an enduring lesson about immigration in Canada. It's no coincidence that our country's greatest eras of economic expansion from the turn of the 20th century to the post-World War II boom to the impressive growth over the past number of years, all of them have coincided with significant immigration. That's because when our population grows, our economy grows and all Canadians benefit. We're at a unique juncture in Canadian history. We're facing the challenge of our generation and together we will meet the moment. And that's why I was very excited to recently table our annual immigration plan for 2021 to 2023, which is our roadmap for the future. Immigration is the key to our short-term economic recovery and long-term prosperity. And that's why the plan lays out a vision to increase our numbers over the next three years by about 1% of our country's domestic population. Travel restrictions and other constraints have led to a shortfall this year, and we'll need to redouble our efforts to make up for it. With nearly 60% of all new admissions in the economic class, our plan is focused on creating jobs. Communities with the most immigration consistently see the fastest growth, which is why we're working to attract more newcomers to smaller cities and rural regions, building on the success of our Atlantic immigration and rural and Northern immigration pilot programs. Nous reconnaissons également l'importance d'appuyer les nouveaux arrivants d'expression française pour contribuer à la vitalité et au dynamisme de nos communautés francophones hors Québec. Nous l'avons présenté par des actions concrètes, nous le réitérons aujourd'hui. We believe in keeping families together, which is why we continue to support family reunification through various programs. It goes without saying that 2020 has been particularly challenging in this regard. While travel has been restricted, we provided exemptions for immediate family and have made it easier for them to be here for longer. And we recently extended those measures to ensure families with loved ones abroad can be together in this most challenging time. Le plan continue également de faire de la réunification des familles une priorité et de maintenir le Canada comme un lieu de refuge fiable pour ceux et celles qui fuient les conflits et les persécutions. 
Dans le cadre du plan, nous élargirons aussi les voies économiques vers la résidence permanente pour les réfugiés qui possèdent les compétences nécessaires à notre économie. Le plan souligne également l'importance d'accueillir les nouveaux arrivants francophones qui contribuaient à la vitalité et au dynamisme de nos communautés francophones. Comme vous le savez probablement déjà, nous modifions notre système entrée express pour attribuer des points supplémentaires au Canada francophone et bilingue. As we talk about attracting top talent, international students, francophone immigrants, and supporting family reunification and refugees, we remain mindful of the unpredictability of our current global health crisis, and we recognize there are external factors beyond our control. That being said, we will continue to adapt and streamline our processes and increase flexibility and certainty where we can. We continue to accept applications and are processing them as quickly as possible. And we know that we must continue to innovate and evolve our business in order to meet our targets going forward. We also know that a large number of applicants who will be admitted under the plan are already in Canada on temporary status, such as students or temporary workers. And we will look very closely at those populations as well. Canadians understand that in spite of the challenges of our pandemic, our immigration system is a competitive advantage that fuels Canada's success. Newcomers have played an outsized role in helping us to get through the pandemic, particularly in our hospitals and long-term care homes, and they will help us to recover from it long after its effects subside. La hausse des niveaux d'immigration nous aidera à remédier aux problèmes démographiques qui continueront de nous affecter bien après la pandémie et définir nos intentions ou les années à venir. This is the choice we can make together for our country. It's the choice we should make now so that Canada's destiny is not constrained by our demographics. Immigration speaks to who we were, who we are, and who we hope to be. We're choosing to be open, vibrant, and prosperous. And I know that we can count on your partnership, guidance, and support every step of the way. Merci. Thank you, Minister. Thank you very much. Um, I, I don't suppose it's a surprise. We have a good long list of questions here and hopefully you've got some time to answer uh, or respond to some of those questions. Um, so I'll just start and, and uh, here we go. So uh, with the increase in newcomer numbers over the coming years in the new plan, what additional settlement investment is planned, especially related to remote and digital services that we're relying on more and more now? Well, thank you very much for that question. And uh, certainly, as I said, I'm excited to have tabled our immigration plan for 2021 to 2023, a little more than two weeks ago. And the reason why I have been very encouraged is that there is a broad swath of support for continuing to grow through immigration. And by that, I mean, not only within government and not only within our um, stakeholders, including the many member organizations who are part of the Pathways to Prosperity, but also uh, within the private sector and within business and among labor leadership. And when you are able to build a coalition of support behind a plan that does seek to grow through immigration, it allows us to implement and to deliver. And here, I'll, I'll, I'll get right to the core of your question. As part of this plan to grow immigration, we are ensuring that we are going to invest the additional resources, both through funding as well as through policy support to our settlement service organizations, many of whom who are on this call and to whom we owe a tremendous debt of gratitude for the work that you are doing throughout the pandemic. We're also going to leverage digital and technological innovations. And we have already begun to do that in the context of this pandemic. And I'll take two examples. One is uh, through our uh, permanent residency program. And I mentioned it in the, in the context of my remarks. Our express entry program is certainly one of the flagships of our immigration framework, and it has been recognized by the OECD as being one of the shining examples in the world at how to integrate. Um, we are moving more of those services online. It has traditionally been a very paper-based uh, system and process, particularly as you start to make your way towards the latter stages of landing in permanent residency. And what we have done is we have incorporated uh, some of our experiences through the pandemic and have found a way to place more of those final stages 
online, and that is going to shorten the time frame for integrating. Another uh, example is through our citizenship uh, process. And I have been very pleased to participate now in a number of uh, ceremonies online where we are welcoming uh, newcomers to the family of Canadian citizenship. But equally, we're looking at ways to move our citizenship testing uh, process online as well. And that is something that I hope to be uh, able to say more about in the very, very short term. So notwithstanding the challenges, I do believe that the support, the funding, and the policy flexibility through innovation and technology will allow us to become an even more efficient uh, uh, system and organization going forward. Thank you very much. Um, now, another question, this won't surprise you. Uh, while we have researchers, we also have uh, settlement service providers among the many people here this morning. Um, so one of the questions that I think has been on people's mind for some time, and I see here highly voted, uh, can you please give us any updates on how COVID will affect budgets this year as far as slippage and new neg negotiations for the new year, uh, the new fiscal year coming up? Well, I, I appreciate the, uh, the the candor of the question. And I know uh, in particular, our, our settlement service organizations are very anxious to know more about um, the funding and the support. And I just want to take a moment to highlight some of the main um, sponsors and partners uh, to today's uh, virtual conference, in particular, those settlement service uh, organizations in Calgary. And I've had the great pleasure to meet with many of them and am so grateful uh, for their collaboration today. But I will uh, assure them and all of the people on this call and right across the country that the support that you need will be there, that we recognize that if we are going to uh, introduce a plan that seeks to grow through immigration, that we have to be sure that we are providing the funding that is necessary to make those levels and those goals a reality. And that is something that our government fundamentally believes in. In addition to that, we've had some very constructive feedback around the mandate uh, of settlement uh, service organizations, ensuring that we are introducing the flexibility and the agility within our, our policy frameworks and architectures so that you can continue to deliver. And I, I will just say in concluding this particular uh, response that I have been just, um, I have been blown away by your, uh, by your resolve, by your ability to, uh, to evolve yourself on the ground, notwithstanding the challenges of COVID-19. So we will be there for you and we cannot say thank you enough. Thank you. Um, I'm sure that uh, message is much appreciated. People have worked very hard, as we know, to, to make things happen and to keep serving the people and, and helping them make their, their adjustment. Um, now, in this year, another issue, of course, that has come up uh, very strongly for, and needs addressing is around racism. So. This question asks, what is IRCC's meaningful and actionable plans to address and eliminate systemic racism, specifically anti-Black racism within the department and within the sector more broadly? Well, I appreciate the question. And I think we do have to stop as, as difficult as it is and take stock of where we are. And that is, uh, Canada is not immune from racism in all of its forms. Um, I think at times we, we tend to cast our eyes abroad and think that there are challenges in, in other countries, but the, the, the sad and tragic reality is that we experience it here. We see it overtly, sometimes we see it flagrantly and violently, and often as well, we see racism uh, embedded within our institutions and systemically. And it is important to draw distinctions between each of those ca categories because it's important not only as uh, as a government, uh, but as uh, but as a a group of people who are tied together uh, by the common cause of creating a better society that we acknowledge it. And so it must begin with a fundamental acknowledgement that we still experience uh, racism in Canada. At the same time, certainly uh, within our department at IRCC, we are trying to reflect back a diverse organization so that we can create the space. Uh, for the kind of meaningful reforms that are necessary to reduce those systemic barriers, which have far too long, I think, plagued us. And I think it's, it's, all, it's about having people that reflect the diversity of, 
of, of the country, but it's also about putting a lens on our own processes. And I know that we have really set ourselves to doing that by, by ensuring that we are removing the barriers that have existed for far too long. The other thing that I we need to do is we need to measure our outcomes. And I think not only in IRCC, but right across society, in government, um, in the private sector, we can and should do better on that front so that we can see where we are making progress. I'll say outside of the context of my role uh, as the Minister for Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship, and before I got into politics, I worked on the front lines of the criminal justice system. And I saw every day uh, the impacts of systemic racism uh, within our uh, within society, and I saw it. I saw systemic barriers manifest through the overrepresentation of Black Canadians and, and members of racialized communities and Indigenous peoples overrepresented in our jails. We have to do better, and we are very much, uh, I think, resolved to uh, to make the progress that is necessary, as I've described in some of the concrete measures. Thank you. Um, this is a bit of a different tag. We have a, a question about the municipal uh, immigration program and when it will be launched. And is there any new information you can provide about the program? Well, I'm uh, also very um, excited about the municipal nominee program. It is part of my mandate. And just a quick recap, th this is a pilot that is very much built on the success of other pilot programs that are aimed at distributing immigration across the country. And I often say that if we never advertised or said another word about immigration, people from abroad would continue to pour into the big cities like my hometown in Toronto and Vancouver and Calgary and uh, Edmonton and, and, and Halifax and Montreal and elsewhere. Uh, what's imperative is that we uh, remind ourselves that there are opportunities abound right across the country. And so the municipal nominee program would seek uh, ways to uh, partner with municipalities and to get feedback uh, from that level, uh, from uh, municipal leadership in government, but equally from the private sector and other uh, civil uh, organizations so that we could better understand the needs of the community and promote and foster greater pathways to distribute immigration. We've consulted uh, extensively and we are now moving into the next phase of the launch of the Municipal Nominee Program, which I hope to see uh, sometime in the first half of 2021. But this is going to be uh, very much part of our immigration framework going forward. And I'm, I'm optimistic about the work that lies ahead. Thank you. Uh, we have a question about uh, open work permits and uh, whether IRCC uh, might consider open work permits for individuals who are visitors uh, in Canada but who cannot return home uh, currently due to the pandemic. And is there any consideration of that? Um, well, that is one which I am happy to say is uh, a check mark. We we have this is one of those examples where we have as an organization looked at our policies and have tried to uh, respond to the challenges posed by the pandemic. And so for those um, visitor uh, visitors who are in Canada, who possess a certain skill set, who've had to overstay their original plans and uh, who are able to um, uh, work and receive a job offer that we are creating that flexibility so that they can move into the open work permit space. I will say that uh, that example, uh, plus as well, uh, providing individuals uh, in already in the work permit space with extensions to restore their status are just two of the many ways in which we are trying to be flexible and responsive to uh, the disruption that has been caused by COVID-19. And I think the, that, that the vast majority of Canadians will understand and appreciate that if there are people who are here, on temporary status, but who can make lasting contributions there through their work, that we should uh, allow them uh, these opportunities, both uh, to move from visitor to work status, but equally if they're here as workers or students on temporary status, that we might consider broadening the pathway to becoming a permanent residency. That will help us provide reinforcements to essential uh, sectors like the healthcare system, which are desperately needed right now, as we're seeing doctors, nurses, and support workers just go flat out. And so I would be remiss if I didn't take a moment to say uh, that we're so grateful to them. Uh, and we know that you are uh, just 
exhausted and immigration can provide some of the, the additional support and reinforcements that you need to get us through the second wave. Thank you. I guess maybe a, a question that follows on that a little bit is um, COVID-19 obviously has highlighted uh, gaps and challenges and it's one thing it's highlighted is the renewed need for lower skilled immigrants uh, to address essential labor market needs um, but our system tends to favor those in the higher skilled areas and you know are there are you looking at addressing some of those gaps as I said, I think we're at a, a very unique moment where we should be looking within our own borders at the talent pool that exists in Canada already. And that talent exists on a continuum of and, and a range of uh, different skill sets that are required right across the economy. And you're quite right. Uh, it does include those who possess um, skills, uh, you know, that, that do not necessarily require uh, upper or higher education or post-secondary degrees, but that are nonetheless uh, required in order to ensure things like food security. I have been listening very carefully, as I know my colleagues, uh, Minister Bibo and Qualtro, to uh, those advocacy organizations who have been uh, asking the government to, to look at the conditions and the workplace safety protections that are in place for our migrant workers, for example, that work in the agricultural sector. It's one of the reasons why our government has put into, um, uh, the, uh, into that system over $100 million to improve uh, work and uh, health, healthy, uh, healthy uh, uh, protections that are required uh, to address some of the challenges that we've seen on our farms and our food processing plants. And we're also reflecting on uh, some of the uh, feedback that we've been receiving around uh, status. And there, I, I do think, is an opportunity uh, to have that discussion. I also think that we have to be um, very upfront about what are some of the other structural challenges that have led to the uh, gaps in those particular parts of the economy. And it does mean uh, partnering very closely with both the provincial governments who uh, are very much on the front lines of sharing the responsibility of protecting workers' rights, as well as uh, employers and farmers themselves. I think this is part of a broader conversation at looking at workers and students right across the, uh, the continuum to see whether or not there's a way to accelerate their pathway to becoming permanent residents, which will help us address our economic challenges today, as well as the long-term demographic challenges that we face as an aging population. Thank you. I think we have time for just one more question. And um, I think obviously this is one of the vulnerabilities that has come up in the last while as we've switched very much more to doing distance uh, work. So given settlement services uh, are more and more being delivered online, will IRCC be looking at funding initiatives that will facilitate online participation, particularly of vulnerable or barriered uh, clients? The short answer is yes. I think we do need to be open to receiving those types of proposals and only because it, it builds on one of the most successful features of our immigration system, namely uh, that we do begin the process of integration uh, prior to arriving in Canada. It's, we've been heralded by the OECD for doing that very well. I was invited by Chancellor Merkel to speak in Germany uh, about this very issue. And so I do think it behooves us to uh, move more of that process online. And more importantly, it's, it's part of our broader initiative to digitally transform the way we do immigration in Canada. And I think the, the vision that I have, and one that I hope that you all share, is that we will leverage every innovation, every technology so that the journey of, of uh, coming to Canada, whether it's uh, on a temporary status or whether it's on a permanent status to build that next chapter of your life will be uh, one of the most efficient, inclusive and integrated experiences around the world from A to Z. I'm confident that we can realize that vision because we have a government that believes in the fundamental value that immigration contributes, not only economically, but to the rich diversity that is reflected within our, our society. And so I think we we're, we're very grateful for the people that are on this call, the people that make up the organizations who are doing the hard work amidst the pandemic, finding ways to keep 
Canada open despite uh, this challenging moment. That's why I'm confident about uh, the future of immigration in Canada. It's because of you. And I'm grateful to have had the opportunity to have this conversation this morning. Thank you very much, Minister. We're also very grateful that you have spent the time with us this morning, uh, opening this eighth Pathways to Prosperity uh, conference, obviously being done in a new way for us. Um, so very much appreciate your being here and answering your questions and your enthusiasm for your role. Thank you very much.